G'day maths nerds, welcome back to McGrathematics where we're kicking off with a flashback question involving some counting techniques before today's lesson. Uh, if you already know how to approach these, pause the video and have a go yourself before I run through my answers in a sec. Okay, so we've got a license plate, it's gonna have two digits, two letters, and then two digits all at random. Um, it doesn't say that we can't use or repeat a digits or letter, so we can assume that we can do that. Question A is how many different license plates are possible? Okay, so we're going to think of this as a six-stage event. The first stages are two digits, then two letters, then two more digits. At each stage, if we can just calculate how many different options there are and multiply them all together, that'll give us our total uh, different possibilities. So for our two digits, we're going to have 10 options from 0 through to 9. For our letters, we have 26 options. And then for two digits, again, we have 10 options. Multiplying these all together, we get about 6.76 million uh, different possible license plates. Okay, question B is what is the probability that the last digit is prime? So for our last digit, we have 10 options and how many of those are going to be prime? Well, two, three, five, and seven are all prime numbers less than 10. So that's four options out of 10, which is two out of five. And then option C, uh, question C, find the probability the plate will say 69LM40. Okay, so right in here is uh, one possible combination of two digits, two letters, two digits. So this is one out of our possible 6.76 million po uh, possibilities. So if we had a um, randomly generated plate, the probability we end up with this specific combination would be one out of 6.76 million, okay? Because it's one of the combinations. Okay, today's lesson is all about the pigeonhole principle in the extension one course. So to start off with, we have a question to think about in terms of pigeonholes and stuff like that. So let's say I have four different color of socks in my drawer. Uh, for some reason, I'm drawing socks from my drawer with a blindfold on, so I'm not looking to see what color I get when I pick them out. The question is how many times will I have to pick out a sock blindfolded before I can confidently say that I have a pair somewhere in my hand? So if we think about this, let's say I'm trying to get a pair and I'm getting really unlucky, and each of my first four goes, I get a different color. Well, then on my fifth go, I have to get one of the four colors that I've already picked out. Okay, so, so five is the minimum number of picks that I would need to ensure that I have at least one matching pair picked out of the drawer. All right, so this concept is called the pigeonhole principle. So the pigeonhole principle states that if you have n plus one pigeons placed into n pigeonholes like this, uh, you'll have at least one pigeonhole containing at least two pigeons. Okay, because if you had n pigeons, um, they would all be filled up and then you have to put that extra one somewhere like with the socks and so um, There's gonna be an extra pigeonhole somewhere. That's got at least two pigeons. Okay, for example, you couldn't fit um, Six pigeons into five pigeonholes without having at least two in one of the pigeonholes. That's the idea Seems very simple, but we can apply it to some seemingly complicated problems to make them a lot easier and quick to answer So first examples um, at Nara high school there are 900 students how many students must be selected at random before we can be sure that we have two students who share a birthday? Okay, so again, let's think. Um, I'm picking out students at random and I'm trying to get two that have the same matching birthday, but I keep getting really unlucky. And each time I pick a different birthday. How many different times could I get unlucky? It's like asking how many different birthdays there are. And if we include February 29 as a possible birthday, there would be 366 um, birthdays. That means if I pick 367 students for, at random, we know that because there are more pigeons and pigeonholes to tie it back, uh, we're gonna have at least two students who share a birthday. Okay, so to figure out how many pigeonholes there are and we would need one extra pigeon. So 366 dates means we need 367 students to be confident that we have at least two students matching. Question two, what is the minimum number of people needed to guarantee that at least two people have the same initials for their first name and surname? Okay, so we're trying to say how many people we need to gather to be confident we have two people sharing initials. So we need to figure out how many different possible initials there are. Okay, so initials are two letters, uh, which means there are 26 times 26 possible combinations, 26 for the first letter, 26 for the second. So in total, there should be 676 combinations of initials. That means if we selected 677 people, we have one extra pigeon than our number of pigeonholes, which means they're gonna to have to have at least two people who are matching up and having the exact same initials. 
Okay, to make this more general in terms of um, different numbers, if we had n pigeons and they were sitting in k pigeonholes where there are more pigeons than pigeonholes, then there is at least one pigeonhole with at least n over k and divided by k pigeons. All right, to make uh, more sense of this, I'll give you some numbers and some context. So let's say we had five pigeons and they were sitting in two pigeonholes. So n is five, k is two. Then one of the pigeonholes must have at least five divided by two, which is 2.5 pigeons. Uh, however, there should be a full stop there. However, since the boxes can't have half pigeons, uh, that means that we must have at least one of our pigeonholes having three. Okay, we could have two and three, three and two, four and one, one and four, five and zero, zero and five. All of those possibilities uh, have at least one pigeonhole with at least three pigeons. Okay, so when you have two numbers, if you divide them, it gives you your minimum number per pigeonhole is the idea. Let's apply this to a couple of examples. Here's our first one. At um, Nara High School, there are seven year 11 maths classes and 117 students in total. Show that there is at least one maths class with 17 students. Okay, so we're gonna think of our pigeons as our students and our pigeonholes are gonna be our classes. So we have 117 pigeons shared amongst uh, seven pigeonholes. So if we do 117 divided by seven, we get 16.7, so 16 with a remainder. And this number is bigger than 16. That tells us because if we share them out evenly amongst all classes, all classes would have 16 and there'd still be some leftover students that would need to go somewhere. This tells us using the generalized pigeonhole principle, there must be at least one class that has more than 16 students, so it must have at least 17 students. Okay, question four is kind of the reverse logic of this. It says, uh, if n cows are put into two paddocks, there is at least one paddock with 15 cattle. What is the value of n? Okay, so we're saying if we divided n number of cows amongst two paddocks, um, there'd be at least one paddock with 15 cattle. So that's, this value would be greater than 14. Okay, so uh, we're gonna multiply the two across and say n is greater than 28. And so if n is greater than 28, the smallest possible value of n is gonna be 29. Okay, so if you had 29 cows shared between two paddocks, you're always gonna have one paddock have, having at least uh, 15 cows. Okay, these two examples are pretty similar to the ones before. So if you feel like you're getting this, I encourage you to pause the video and try these by yourself before I run through the solution. Um, or if you just wanna watch it along, how am I gonna possibly stop you? All right, question five. We have 50 baskets of apples. Each basket contains no more than 24 apples. Show there are at least three baskets containing the same number of apples. So for this one, our pigeons are our baskets of apples and our pigeonholes are our categorization of how many apples they have. Okay, you can have, um, we can have one apple, you can have two apples, all the way up to 24 apples. Okay, so our 50 baskets are being divided into one of 24 categories. So using our generalized pigeonhole principle, we can do 50 divided by 24. This gets us a value of 2.083, so two with a remainder. So this number is larger than two, okay? This tells us that if every single um, category of apples from, from one to 24, if we share the 50 baskets amongst them, there will be two in everything, and then there'll be a leftover, which is gonna fill up another one and give us three, okay? So this is enough to show that using the pigeonhole principle, there has to be one basket at least with greater than two. So we say at least three apples. Okay, question six, we are doing X number of wizards divided amongst four houses and there are at least 55 wizards in at least one house. So we know that when we do X divided by four, there are at least 55. So this value is going to be larger than 54. Okay, so you always do one less and it works out really nicely. Multiply the four across and we get X is bigger than 216. So the smallest possible value is gonna be 217. Okay, 217 wizards divided amongst four houses. You're always gonna have at least 55 wizards in at least one of the houses. Okay, and a bit of a tricky one uh, to finish off this section. We've got a box containing four red, six green, eight blue, 10 yellow, and 12 white balls. What is the minimum number of balls we need to choose randomly from the box to guarantee we have eight of the same color? Okay, so let's think about we're trying to get eight of the same color and we're getting unlucky as humanly possible and it's taking us as long as possible. Okay, let's say the first four that we picked were um, red. And then the next six we picked out were all the green ones. And then we didn't get all the blues, we only got seven of them. And then out of the 10 yellow ones, we got seven. I remember we're trying to get eight, we're getting really unlucky. Then our next seven picks are all white. Okay, so we've got all the reds, all the greens, and seven from blue, yellow, and white. So we still haven't quite got 
um, eight of one color yet. So so far we picked 31, balls out, okay? Now if we pick out one more, it can't be red, it can't be green, it's gotta be blue, yellow, or white. So one of these categories is gonna turn into an eight, and now we know we'll have eight balls of the same color. Okay, that tells us that uh, the 30 second ball is the one that for sure has to at least put us over eight in at least one of the colors. So 32 is the answer. Okay, let's uh, rip into some HSC questions. This first one is from the recent 2022 HSC. It's a band three, so it's not super, super spicy. Uh, we've got a sports association manages 13 junior teams. It checks the age of all players. If any team has more than three players who are above the age limit, they're gonna be penalized. We know that there are 41 players in total who are above the age limit, so will any team be penalized? Justify your answer. Okay, so to get full marks, you don't just need a yes or a no here, you need to explain your answer, hopefully using the pigeonhole principle. Okay, so have a go if you want, otherwise I'm about to go through the answer and spoil it for you. Okay, so 41 players um, are above the age limit and we have 13 teams. So in terms of our context of pigeons and pigeonholes, we're gonna say the 41 players are our pigeons um, and we're dividing them into 13 teams which are our pigeonholes. So if we do 41 divided by 13, we get 3.15, or another way you could write this is three remainder two. This means if we were sharing the players evenly amongst the 13 teams, they would have you would have three in each team, and then you'd have um, two teams that go into four, okay? So because 41 divided by 13 is larger than three, using the pigeonhole principle, this tells us that you'll have at least one team that has more than three players. You're gonna have four in at least one team, maybe two, okay? So because our division gets us a number larger than three, we can justify the pigeonhole principle and say that, um, yes, there will be a team with four players at least, and so some team is gonna get penalized, and that's your two marks. Okay, finishing off with a couple of challenge questions. Um, these are the hardest ones that I could find on the internet, but if you have any others that you wanna post in the comments, by all means, I'm always looking for good pigeonhole principle questions. Okay, five points inside an equilateral triangle of side length two. Show that at least two of the points are within one unit distance of each other. Okay, if you're trying this one at home, I recommend drawing a picture which might help you out a bit. Uh, for example, here is my picture. Here is an equilateral triangle and all the side lengths are two units. Now, we're trying to show that if we had um, five points in this triangle, you're going to have at least two of them within one unit of each other. So the key to this question is to split your triangle into four pigeonholes. And by pigeonholes, I mean four equally sized triangles as well, like this, okay? This is me splitting my um, equilateral triangle into four equilateral triangles. Now, because these are all half the size of the larger triangle, all their side lengths are one unit. Okay, now hopefully it's kind of obvious that if I put four points into this, they would all be within one of the four triangles. And now if I try and fit a fifth point in here, the fifth point has to be in one of these four triangles as one of the four pigeonholes. But because all these triangles are one unit in length, any dot that I put in one of these four triangles is gonna be within one point of another of the four points. Okay, so now it's impossible. It is not possible to put a fifth point in here that is more than a one unit away from one of these other four dots. And so there's our proof. Okay, and last one, 15 people are attending a party and shake the hand of every person they meet. Um, show that there are at least two people in attendance who have shaken the same number of hands. Okay, this is a challenging one for me because I've never actually attended a party, so I've got no idea what they're talking about, but I'm just gonna try and make it up. So we are trying to figure out what are our pigeonholes and what are our pigeons. This one we're gonna say, our pigeonholes are number of handshakes. That's our categorization. And the pigeons will be people at the party. Okay, so the people are all gonna fit into a category of how many hands they have shaken. So we've got 15 guests at the party. And the problem is it looks like we have 15 pigeonholes because you could shake zero hands, one hand, two hands, three hands, all the way up to 14 hands. We can't have 15 because you can't shake your hand. It is um, frowned upon at most parties, so I'm told. So we're gonna ignore that. So how does this work? We have 15 guests and 15 pigeonholes. So it seems like we have a one-to-one -one matchup and we're not gonna have at least two who have shaken the same number of hands. Until you realize the key of the question is that we cannot have zero and 14 both in our sample space. Why is zero and 14 both impossible? Well, zero is saying that there is someone at the party who has shaken no hands. They've just been sitting in the corner, drinking and being weird, okay? 14 is saying that someone has shaken every other person's hand at the party, okay? 
So how can you have a party where there's a person who has shaken no hands and a person who has shaken every hand? Well, this is impossible. This tells us that we can't have zero and 14 uh, in our sample space. So there are not 15 pigeonholes, there are 14 pigeonholes, okay? So we have 14 classifications for 15 guests and by the pigeonhole principle, this tells us that we're gonna have at least two people who are in the same category and have shaken the same number of hands. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a bit of a weird one to visualize, but anyway. Okay, that will do it uh, for today's lesson. If you are looking for some more practice questions, um, I recommend looking up online because this exercise is not fantastic, but it's better than nothing. But yeah, I've, I found a lot just by Googling um, pigeonhole principle questions if you want some more practice. Okay, cool. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in my next extension one video. Bye for now, not forever.